I'm John Linchowski, President of the Institute, and I'm uh, <coughs> delighted and honored to see all of you here, and particularly to see the participation of uh, the members of our distinguished panel today. We have a, uh, a, a very, uh, this is a, a, a most noteworthy event here at IWP, uh, because it, uh, we, we are uh, in a partnership with Good of All, which is uh, an extraordinary organization that has undertaken a most uh, strategic task to fight the war of ideas uh, at a time when this, when this war needs to be fought and hardly anybody else is fighting it. Uh, I'll, uh, I'd like to be able to comment a little bit more about this uh, a little bit later on, but uh, this, is a, this is an effort to revive the whole concept of human rights uh, as a positive alternative to some of the radical ideologies that are producing so much human suffering around the world and the waste of so many scarce resources. And uh, this, this effort has been spearheaded by Good of All's founder, Dr. Matt Daniels, uh, who has embarked upon this project and over the past couple of years has uh, uh, been involved with setting up academic centers in three different countries uh, where where, he, where, where these centers would be the sources of the radiation of some of these ideas to their respective regions of the world. One was set up in, in South Korea, another in England, and Matt approached us about hosting uh, this academic center uh, here in the United States. Uh, our center is called the Center for Human Rights and International Affairs, and it is designed to uh, to study and promote the, the idea of human rights in the world. And uh, now, uh, Dr. Daniels is also now Professor Daniels, and so far as he is teaching uh, a course on human rights and international affairs here at IWP. So it is uh, with great pleasure that I introduce uh, Dr. Daniels to you, and, and uh, the floor is yours, Matt. Thanks everybody for coming, and thank you, John, for hosting this. And you're fighting a virus. I appreciate it. And thank you, everyone on the panel, for coming. Uh, Pleasure. The rise of ISIS is a symptom of a trend that unfortunately has uh, been um, working its way uh, around the world for the past decade, and we've been seeing setbacks uh, globally for human rights. Um, there are uh, many ways to uh, fight that virus. Um, we're interested in uh, a long-term solution, which is the war of ideas that inoculates hearts and minds against the virus before it can take root. Um, our uh, thrust with this initiative uh, is to put two things together. Um, the concept of universal human rights, which we believe is deeply appealing to the human spirit uh, and is rooted in uh, history, a history of suffering, uh, comes out of our experience with the Holocaust. Uh, and is codified in a UN document called the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. We want to combine that concept of universal human rights with the communication and social networking power of the Internet to reach a digital generation with these ideals in the hope of inoculating their minds against extremism and against oppression. Um, so Good of All does that uh, in uh, three different countries. Uh, John mentioned the uh, countries where we have academic centers. Uh, we're a public education movement. We use the web uh, as well as a, a traditional means of communication like this event. Um, and we are essentially betting on the proposition that ordinary men and women around the world are the ones who have the greatest interest in protecting and promoting their own human rights. And that the digital age has allowed us to uh, organize, mobilize, and educate them in new ways uh, against the forces of oppression. Um, 
I'm an attorney with a PhD in politics. When I first read the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, I was struck by the brilliance of this idea of the concept of universal human rights, uh, rights that transcend race, that transcend gender, that transcend national origin. Uh, uh, this idea is deeply appealing to the human spirit because the things we have in common as people transcend these superficial differences of race, gender, class. Um, but the idea at the core of the Universal Declaration, this concept of universal human rights, was arguably 50 years ahead of its time when the document was drafted in 1948 because there was no way for ordinary men and women to really talk to each other and, and, and build community around this concept. It was years later after doing work in digital media that the light bulb went off in my mind and I realized that the internet was creating uh, a channel for that to happen. Um, and so our movement in its uh, simplest sense is an effort to try to help the idea virus of universal rights <coughs> spread more quickly through digital media. Um, the statement that we're distributing today through this website, softpower.org, um, is uh, an effort to try to put a name on uh, what we're calling digital soft power. Digital soft power is uh, probably an idea that really just builds on Joseph Nye's core concept of soft power. Um, so it's, it's the notion that uh, entities that interact with the public online uh, gain public support and influence by demonstrating respect for people's fundamental human rights as defined in the Universal Declaration. Um, we uh, are building a human rights and security network around the vision of our statement, uh, and we are going to be engaged in a range of activities to try to promote the vision of the statement and work its principles into uh, our society and other societies around the world. So we're going to be doing principally five things. One. We're going to be expanding the international network of academic experts, scholars, and practitioners who support the vision of this statement. Two, we're going to facilitate these people working together, networking uh, internationally on behalf of the vision of soft power. Three, we're going to have our academic centers on three continents do reports and publications to help deepen uh, the scholarship, uh, the credibility of the concept of digital soft power, and the support that it enjoys. Four, we're going to publish op-eds, uh, pieces in the traditional media and the digital media that uh, apply the concept of digital soft power to different issues. You'll see one that just appeared this morning in The Hill that Ali Soufan, a uh, former FBI uh, uh, official uh, and member of the Board of the Homeland Security Advisory Council, authored for us. Um, and it should be in your packets. It's a good piece. Um, and we're going to host regular meetings of the Human Rights and Security Network here at IWP. So I'd like to issue an invitation to all of you who may be interested in this topic to partner with us, to participate with us. Uh, we'd like to have you engaged. Uh, this is going to be uh, successful if and only if uh, we broaden the circle of people who embrace the idea. And thank you for being with us here today. Thanks. It's now uh, my great pleasure to introduce uh, Judge William Webster, former uh, director of the FBI and uh, director of Central Intelligence. Uh, we are honored that the judge is also a member of the Board of Trustees here at IWP, and uh, he has been involved in so many different aspects of public service, it makes the head swim. The judge, the floor is yours. Pleasure to be back in any capacity. I always look forward to occasions to come here and as a relatively new member of the Board of Directors to see this uh, launching of a very important program. Promoting fundamental human rights is imperative to national security and international peace. And we have to find more and more ways to make use of every tool that's available to advance these principles of freedom in the digital age. I uh, can't help but think uh, during the Cold War how effective we were in introducing subvertly, uh, because of the circumstances of the Cold War, the Federalist Papers produced and published in Central Europe and there were found there was an enormous thirst for the principles that were advanced in those discussions. We take for granted as students when we study the Federalist Papers 
And that's true in a large sense what we're talking about today, only we're doing talking about expanding it into the digital age. Uh, I think both uh, Chancellor Lankowski and Matt Daniels are to be commended for this visionary project. It builds on the very best traditions of our nation as a beacon for the free world. These messages uh, endure. Uh, the principles expressed in the Declaration of Independence, the Bill of Rights and the Constitution, perhaps the most revered speech in our history, the Gettysburg Address all advance the kind of principles that promote peace and security rather than violence and turmoil. The digital soft power educational campaign, this is the first project of this new academic center and it builds on the strength of both IPW and good of all, of IWP and good of all. Uh, it's just in the best traditions of our country and it's a way which we can expand through the use of digital power, which is soft power, a message for people of, of all, all nations in the world are responsive to these fundamental principles. They need to be codified and reminded if we're going to combat the, the expanding risks of, of violence and extremism around the world. And I think that this is a good place, can't think of a better place, to launch it, and I wish you all the best, Matt and Ms. John, as you, as you go forward. <clears throat> the Universal Declaration of Human Rights is not as well known as it ought to be. It's been around since 1948. But to read it, to uh, see the codification of all of those principles that we respect and hold dear and need to be extended to other people in the world who have not thought about how important it is to value human rights, human dignity, and respect, and peaceable respect for all that are involved. So thank you very much for letting me be part of this opening session. <laughs>
By the way, my father was an advisor there at the United Nations when that happened. I never thought it would have any particular significance, but we have reached a time in our history when either we pay attention to it or we will be overcome with the violence that seems prone everywhere in the world. The man on my left, General Myers, is involved with the military for years and has this experience and is an expert in it and knows how swiftly those things happen. But we're in a battle for ideas. A battle for ideas. How do they go forward? So I'm, I'm very pleased to be here. I, I, think General, I think Judge Webster is absolutely correct when he says that this is an opportunity that we have at the very beginning to shape or help to shape. And he was willing to step forward to help to shape those things that we may do. I'm convinced that soft power is extremely desirable and much more effective ultimately, pardon me, General, than military power. So go to it. <laughs> It is, uh, it's now a pleasure to introduce General Richard Myers, uh, former chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, who uh, has rendered his own extraordinary service to this country. And I should just observe, Judge, that uh, of, uh, of the many uh, men of arms uh, whom we've been privileged to have up here at the dais uh, at IWP, General Myers has been uh, one of those few who have uh, spent an enormous amount of time thinking and, uh, and advocating for the ideas of soft power precisely to avoid having to go to war. And, uh, and, and I very much welcome his testimony. General. Thanks, John. Thank you. Well, first of all, I don't know that I belong at the same table with these distinguished individuals in public service, so thank you for letting me sit with you this morning. Uh, to John and Matt, this is a terrific opportunity, I think, to talk about something that could have a profound impact on, on how we live and, and on our security. When I was uh, chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, uh, 2001 to 2005, one of the most frustrating things was trying to harness all our instruments, instruments of national power to be brought to the conflicts we had in Iraq and Afghanistan and the wider conflict of terrorism or violent extremism or jihad. Um, it, it's really difficult for any country, our country included, to harness all our instruments of national power, those being the military, the diplomacy, and economics. And I would add a fourth one, and I did often. I don't know if it's in the textbooks over at National Defense University yet, but certainly um, this IT revolution has to be recognized in some way in our instruments of power. So the, so the information revolution, the digital age, all that has to be, it comes down to information and communication. And we, it is a, it's really, really powerful. And so in trying to apply our instruments of national power with our friends and allies in, in two conflicts and then the broader conflict against terrorism, we kept searching for something we call it strategic communications really undefined. We know how to communicate. We know how to do the digits. That's easy. The message was, was always lacking. And, and now I think the, the brilliance of what uh, Dr. Daniels has come up with is this, this intersection of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights and, and the digital age. It's, it's, a, it's a brilliant combination. I wish I could have thought of that in 2001, 2, 3, or 4. We could have we, we could have done a lot of good, although it, I think probably uh, if it's seen as a governmental thing or a partisan thing, it's not going to go very far. This doesn't have to be that way. It's not that way with uh, good for all. This is nonpartisan, uh, apolitical. It's just a couple of really good ideas that have come together that I think are going to be really, really powerful. And if we achieve the potential that I think this has, and I think it means that uh, military instrument of power will be less used in this war on ideas. Uh, right now I believe it's overused, and I've said that many times. I think we've overused the military instrument of power as, and, 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 and not harnessed diplomacy, economics, and the informational instrument of power. And this allows us, I think, to do that in a way 
that will make us all more secure. As to the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, when I lecture to folks, I often get these questions. Well, you know, the, the people of Afghanistan, for instance, uh, they've always been tribal, and they go on and on about how it's an impossible mission in, in Afghanistan. And I think what they forget is that, they, that we all, as humans, have a common thirst for certain things. And this Universal Declaration of Human Rights spells out what those things are. And every human can sign up to those. And we saw that thirst, if you remember back to the elections in Iraq, the elections in Afghanistan, we saw that thirst when people risked their lives to go to the polls. Risked their lives to go to the polls. Uh, they have this thirst. And so, I, again, I think this intersection between um, this notion of Universal Declaration of Human Rights and the digital age and huge youth populations that are digital natives it's going to come together to be a, a powerful force in our world, one that is potentially going to make us and our, our, our families, our children, and our friends and allies around the world uh, a lot more secure in the future. So I'm happy to be part of this effort, and I thank you, Matt and John, for the opportunity. Thank you. Thank you. So, um, so we're going to take your questions for the panel. Um, I, I simply ask that... Um, Two requests, one that you identify your name and affiliation uh, in connection with your question, and two that uh, we use a mic when we answer so we can record the answers. But uh, questions for the panel. So just your name and affiliation. Yes, uh, Carl Golovin. I have a, a student here also associated with jfkvigil.com. A couple, two questions, I'll try to be brief. I think soft power is greatly enhanced by uh, well, integrity and transparency, and it seems that uh, scripture admonishes us that the good of all and dignity are promoted by honest weights and measures, and also by seeking the truth, hence transparency is valued. And uh, concerning honest weights and measures, it seems we've had a form of extremism for about 100 years with the Federal Reserve System of Credit that has empowered and even encouraged a militarization and a corporatization of our foreign affairs. Uh, question, might the world be well served if we were to move forward to a new Bretton Woods kind of international monetary agreement that revalues the honesty of gold as an honest weight and measure so people were paid in, in money that doesn't depreciate quickly? Secondly, in, in terms of transparency, we've just passed the 50th anniversary of the Warren Report, and it's well recognized that 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 was deceptive and that there is much not, not revealed yet. There are documents still withheld by CIA, for example, uh, regarding the events of that day. Would you all recommend that the government uh, relinquish and surrender all documents still withheld? Thank you. But maybe just for the sake of one question at a time, let's just answer the question about the gold standard. Is it, anybody want to comment on the gold standard? I'm, I'm not an expert, so. Well, uh, okay. Carl, I think that, uh, that your point about uh, honest uh, measures of uh, standards and, and, and honest money is, is a fundamental principle of good government. And, uh, and I think uh, that the, the, I also think that, you know, for, for the purposes of what we're talking about here, I think it's a little tangential to some other fundamental questions of, of human rights. There is a relationship. Um, but it is, uh, I mean, the, the, the larger problem of, of, an, of the absence of a monetary standard has, has everything to do with uh, the nature of a government that refuses to uh, maintain, let's say, uh, a certain honest relationship with, the, with its creditors which includes everybody who possesses cash in their wallet because cash is a non-interest bearing debt. And so uh, I, I think that, uh, but, but when, when you look at the scale of violations of, uh, of, of, of human rights, uh, that kind of a violation is something which has taken terrible uh, has taken a terrible toll at certain periods of history, but it isn't the central issue in the world today when it comes to the larger battle of ideas with 
things like the extremist ideologies like radical Islamism. It's a, I think it's a huge issue of domestic policy in countries that already have, that, that already respect the rights of their people to a very large extent. So it's a legitimate issue. Uh, the problem is uh, how relevant is it in fighting the, the, uh, uh, this central battle between those forces that would destroy civilization and those that would protect it. Um, and more questions on the topic, you know, of the, the presentations today. I have a comment. Uh, Mr. Olivet, I think they're pretty much on target. Integrity and transparency are the, the media in which we must work and those ideas which, with which we must work. But I look on terrorism as corrupted revolution. They are rebelling. And they are rebelling. And the revolution is, of course, extremely violent. Now, how do we move that over with the ideas that we want to espouse? And the answer is we have every opportunity. I think Dr. Daniel is absolutely correct. We have every opportunity if we choose to take it to shape ideas about what the world can be and what can be done. I don't know what the standards are be besides integrity. I mean, either people have it or they don't have it. Either we have transparency or we think we do, but we don't. We have a media, and the, the soft power suggestion of this re re resolution is to <coughs> use that media to do it. Therefore, the idea is to actually change the world and its focus on what it's trying to accomplish. That is, fairness of government, power that is not corrupted, those things which are the basis of our government. Judge Webster has referred to it in, in, in our own process of making our nation. And it worked. It worked. So I think we ought to concentrate on that. Thank you for allowing me to comment. Yeah, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights has been called the Bill of Rights for All Humanity. It's one of the uh, monikers for it. Other questions on the topic today? Uh, name and affiliation, if you would. Um, David Gordon, uh, Independent Research Analyst. Uh, first of all, I would like to say that I, I see the brilliance and the vision forward in the humanitarian aspect of what, we're, what you're trying to accomplish. My statement is not really a theoretical one, but more of a personal one. When I grew up, I watched cartoons when I was eight years of age. I didn't turn on the uh, internet and watch Facebook and watch beheadings and killings. So I humbly say this as a young man, standing between my father's generation, which was the Vietnam War, my grandfather's, which was the uh, World War II, and a future generation. How do we balance that exposure to that extremeness with honesty and transparency? So with this said, I believe this goes targets straight to the heart of what you're uh, trying to accomplish here. And I would like to say thank you for your, your idea. Thank you very much. So the, I think the question, in, in a sense, is uh, there's a dark side to the web and to the internet. It's, it's used by evil. Uh, certainly what, what I refer to as the digitally mediated barbarism of, of YouTube beheadings is, is a horrifying example of how this medium, like all media and like all technology, can be used for good or evil. But that just means it's all the more important that we consciously and deliberately use it for good. Because it will be used. Its power will be used. Right? Any other comments on that question? The, the downside of digital media? Other questions? Uh, just name and affiliation. Yes, my name is Liz Captain. I'm an IWP student. I love the idea. Um, I think it's wonderful and great. However, I'd like to point out that how do we strategically insert soft power into regions in which the internet and the use of the digital age is controlled by oppressive regimes and, and, and that sort of thing? So it's great to have the information out there. If the target that we're trying to get to access it cannot access it, then it's useless. So her question is regarding uh, regimes that block access to the internet. Uh, I'll take uh, her, uh, the first crack at answering it, and then the panel can respond. Um, no question, this is one of the great uh, challenges, of the, the worst example probably being North Korea, right? Um, but I believe that the regimes that are trying to censor the internet are fighting a losing battle. 
Um, uh, yes, <clears throat> if you have an utterly authoritarian society like North Korea, <clears throat> you can largely shut out the Internet. But in the information age, the Internet is so essential to a vibrant economy that even regimes like the Chinese government, right, uh, have felt the need to allow some level of Internet access in order to have a vibrant economy. And that's the door through which these ideas can enter. Yes, there is the Great Firewall, but it's also something that millions of people routinely bypass, right? Um, and even within the Great Firewall, there are amazingly interesting conversations happening among uh, Chinese citizens that um, allow a level of freedom and discussion not seen before in China, before the Internet. So you make a fair point. Um, uh, I do think that the regimes that are trying to block and censor the internet <clears throat> are ultimately fighting a losing battle. Other comments? Yeah, just grab the mic, please. I just wanted to mention that uh, uh, I think that there are, uh, and we've seen this, for example, in the case now more recently in Russia, where Russia has used its propaganda machine uh, combined with its efforts to shut down websites, shut down independent media, uh, and to use the words of the Washington Post, brainwash its people as well as the Russian people of, of eastern Ukraine into believing a certain false reality about the Ukrainian political system, particularly that it is a bunch of fascists and Nazis who are running things in Kiev, and who are uh, out there, to, who, are, who are out to, uh, to persecute uh, Russian people in, in the eastern regions of Ukraine. Uh, Moscow managed to, to get a monopoly of, of, of communications effectively for uh, huge swaths of its own country as well as Ukraine, and we had no competitive uh, messaging coming in there. Uh, to a large extent because websites were shut down and because we had unilaterally shut down our shortwave broadcasting uh, by uh, the Voice of America and Radio Liberty and, and into this part of the world. And, and in this connection, shortwave happens to be one of those few media by which a signal can get into denied areas. And, and to relate this to the digital age, there happens to be a technological revolution going on right now in shortwave technology of which just about nobody is aware. It's called DRM. It's, that stands for Digital Radio Mondial. And it has to, and what it is, is the ability to, to, to send a, 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 a shortwave signal from far away. Remember, you don't need shortwave. You can, you can have, we have, for example, in Greenville, North Carolina, shortwave transmitter that can, that can put an entire radio shortwave signal covering all of Africa, for example. Uh, and, and so uh, when we broadcast during the Cold War to Russia, we broadcast from the coast of Spain near Barcelona. Uh, so it's a, a long distance business and with DRM you can send a shortwave signal that is as clear as an FM signal without all of the static and all of the fading in and out and, and DRM can also send text and video and the advantage of DRM is that it can be received anonymously, whereas when you're on the internet, the internet police in your country can keep track of you, identify you as a dissident, and make your life miserable. So I just wanted to take this opportunity to, to, to add that this is a dimension which is, and this is so cheap, it is, it is in, in national strategic terms, it is so cheap, it, it is ridiculous. And yet, <laughs> We uh, are not thinking in these terms. Uh, I think we ought to start doing so. Just, yeah. just one thing, and I'll say non-technical non here, but it, I think it's a great question. But I guess as you look back at the sweep of human history, humans uh, have always found a way to get things that their governments wanted to not deny them. I mean, it's always been the case. Uh, in, a, in, a, in Iran, uh, they'll still listen to the Voice of America, the BBC, they have antennas on the roof that the government says you can't have. They take the risk, they put them up. 
the government will tear them down, they'll put them back up. I mean, this is the human spirit at work, and it'll take some time, particularly in countries like North Korea, but eventually the human spirit will prevail. It always has, and it always will. So this idea of moving forward, uh, yeah, there'll be, it'll go at different, a different pace in different countries and different regions, but it's gonna, it's gonna continue to march just because of the appeal and the thirst for this kind of uh, information and knowledge. By the way, in the subject of North Korea, <clears throat> which is arguably the worst example, right, <clears throat> of blocking the internet, even they have had to contend with Google satellite images of their prison camps, which previously they denied, and now they no longer deny them because the images are, of course, they, they deny that they're doing uh, what we know is um, uh, mass murder inside these camps, but you can't deny the existence of the camps because everyone can see them on Google Maps. And the resolution, by the way, for these publicly available uh, satellite mapping programs is about to go way up due to some declassified technology. You'll be able to see actual people on the ground in the camps. Uh, and that's a good thing. I think that's a great thing. One more question. Anybody? Yes, in the back, way in the back. Sorry, I didn't see you. Name and affiliation? Okay, my name is Isla, and I work on democracy promotion in Europe, Ukraine. And I wanted to talk on the issue of the Russian Today uh, so Russia uh, announced today that they're opening an office, or Russia today announced that they're opening an office in Serbia. They're having talks with the Romanians, it's probably going to go through. They've announced that they're opening an office in Tajikistan, um, and 29 other capitals around the world. And so the Russians seem to have um, a strategy as to where their opening office is um, and, and how they're employing soft power. And if you look at Al Jazeera, for example, the way that they broadcast in the Middle East, they also seem to have a strategy um, as to the places that they broadcast and how they employ their soft power. So my question to the panelists is that um, given the strategies that these media um, outlets have in terms of how they employ soft power, should we have one as well? Um, and what would it be? Would we prioritize uh, Eastern Europe? Would we prioritize the Middle East? Um, and if we do, it would be different because the people that are broadcasting from the Middle East are both state-run and um, you know, independent people who are affiliated with the status groups, whereas in Eastern Europe, it's, it's predominantly the states. So she offered examples of, of, of uh, Al Jazeera, Russia Today, using strategy to promote their ideas in key markets. Comments? Anyone want to address that? Well, the whole world is available. Uh, the whole world is available to us. The media that you choose might not be the most effective to start with, but the idea is travel fast. And as General Meyer said, human dignity is a pretty good idea. You know, it's the fundamental basis for organized nations, and it, it, so it will travel fast. When I was uh, chairman, it came to me, um, this is perhaps a little strange that a chairman would think about this when you got a couple of wars going on, but uh, with the demise of the U.S. Information Agency, uh, I think that's done, uh, probably done us great harm. I mean, the idea was that their, their roles and their mission would be absorbed by the State Department, the United States State Department, but it just hasn't gotten the emphasis. And if you listen to stories of some of some of our great American citizens, how they learned about America, how they learned about our principles. Uh, it was through the libraries and so forth overseas. I, I think probably what, what the Russians are trying to do now. And so I, I took it upon myself with a small staff, but we, we came to the idea of let's push for reinvigorating USIA. Uh, we were resoundingly bashed and ne never, never got very far with that idea. But at least we thought that idea in this war of ideas, that's an essential ingredient. And that could be a lot more digital today than it, it was uh, a couple decades ago. But that notion of what a government can do that is seen as um, not so much propaganda, but information, the way it was handled. Uh, of course, of course uh, it's all in the eyes of the beholder, of course. But th that was a very valuable thing I think we did around the world. And I think we've lost. Uh, lost momentum on that on that particular front as a government. We're going to have here. Uh, you have one more question. Yeah. One more question. Uh, Name and affiliation. Yeah, Randy Lieberman, Reston, Virginia. General Myers, thank you for reading my mind. 
Oh, <laughs> you actually did, because I wanted to ask a question about the USIA. Excuse me. I had a conversation with somebody who did her doctoral thesis at MIT recently. She's <coughs> just seen some water uh, on space and USIA. How America during the 1960s projected the image of sort of space and technology. Mm -hmm. Thank you. You said the powers that be put a kibosh on reinvigorating the USIA. Which powers? And can the USIA be reconstituted as a rose by a different name? Well, you know, I, I can't answer the last, but can it be? I, I'm, not, I'm not sure about that. But Thank you. Remember, as I, as I, I think, as, as, as I recall the history, uh, Congress had a big hand in uh, that decision that did away with USIA and said, we'll just fold this into the other things that the U.S. State Department does. Um, can it be? I think it would take, it would take um, executive branch and uh, legislative branch uh, folks that really thought this was important in the world uh, to, to get that moving along, and, and, and primarily at very high level. So if uh, the Secretary of State or the President thought this was more important, I think the Secretary of Defense could be important in this message as well. It takes budget, but you know, again, not a it's not a huge money. Money would not be the object here, uh, and I think it would take a Congress that would understand that this this really is about, uh, particularly when it comes to violent extremism, really about uh, uh, ideas, and uh, and for a lot of the Muslim world, it's about ideas, and so this would be just one other way to uh, to tell people what the U.S. is all about. I mean, there's so many misconceptions. We, we host a large number of international fellows at National Defense University at both the War College and the Eisenhower School, two what we call senior service schools, lieutenant colonels and colonels. And they come over here for a year. Uh, most bring their families and most have hosts that, you know, bring them into their homes and help them understand American culture. And, you know, some of the myths about American culture that are dispelled in that year are really profound and have an impact on their thinking as they go back to their home country. So that's kind of what we're talking about here, is getting to know uh, the United States better. I mean, that's what, uh, and so I, so I don't know, it would take, it would take some pretty high level folks to say, hey, we've been missing, missing a boat here for a while, and, I, and we need to get, we need to reinvigorate that whole idea. That's what it would take, in my opinion, humble opinion. So we're now going to hear some closing remarks from Dr. Lachowski. I, uh, I can't resist uh, addressing your question, uh, Mr. Lieberman, and, and uh, I, I wrote a book on this subject which is called Full Spectrum Diplomacy and, and Grand Strategy, and it's precisely on why uh, public diplomacy, relations with people and not just with governments, and, and strategic outreach, information, counter-propaganda, political influence of all different kinds, have been systematically neglected uh, by our government, and the and, and the liquidation of the U.S. Information Agency was precisely a, a symptom of the lack of understanding of the strategic power of all of these things. And it is amazing to me, uh, but perhaps not entirely surprising, that it has been the people in the Defense Department, in our armed forces, uh, to secretaries of defense like um, uh, Bob Gates. Uh, who have raised the questions of, of, of the question of where are the civilian agencies when it comes to uh, strategic influence? Uh, Secretary Rumsfeld tried to set up an office of strategic influence in the in the Defense Department, which would uh, fund alternative schools to the radical Islamist madrasas in in Western Pakistan. The idea was let's have some schools that may also be Muslim schools but that will teach people an actual vocation uh, so that they can do something in their lives other than strut around with their AK-47s and grumble around the mosque uh, about, uh, you know, about jihad. Uh, the, uh, this, whole, this was shut down. It was, it was basically, uh, it was shut down. The, the Special Operations Command has, has, has run websites in order to, uh, to try to promote uh, some of these very good ideas and to, to, to combat the ideas of, uh, of, of uh, Islamist extremism 
and the Department of State has gone to the uh, to the U.S. Senate and told them to shut those websites down because uh, uh, th that's the Department of State's turf. And yet it took the Department of State 13 years to set up its Center for uh, uh, Strategic Counterterrorism Communications, which uh, can barely deal with the 500 plus websites that the radical Islamists have been using uh, to promote their ideas and to make jihad and beheadings and all of that stuff cool and fashionable. And so uh, I think that this has been largely, a, a, this is a problem of the bureaucratic culture in the State Department and, and it's a problem also of, of the lack of education and lack of knowledge about these subjects. It's one reason why the Institute of World Politics exists is precisely to educate about these matters. Is it arrogance, ultimately, why it was shut down? Well, I think it's I, I I I think that most of the people in our government are people of goodwill and of patriotism who are trying to do some of the right things for our country, and but there 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 is a kind of a, a, a bureaucratic uh, turf consciousness and uh, that that is at odds with the overall national interest, and it is something that can happen in many different agencies. It was one of the causes that underlay uh, the reluctance of people to share intelligence information uh, among agent, other agencies. And, and, and this is where you know, such exercises as the Goldwater-Nichols Act, which helped bring about jointness among the armed forces, were extremely healthy <coughs> innovations uh, for, for, the, for the integrated strategic operations of our government. And so, uh, Yes. Do you think part of the problem with the State Department might be that they've been infiltrated or had a lot of people hired who are sympathetic to the other side? I think that's a, a different problem, actually. I think that we would, because, because the problem of public diplomacy is, is one that's not simply geared towards the, the, the issues of radical Islamism. It is, it is, uh, it's something that is all over the map when it comes to uh, you know, relations with the North Korean people, relations with the Chinese people. I mean, look, the Broadcasting Board of Governors tried to, three years ago, tried to shut down all Mandarin and Cantonese broadcasts over the Voice of America to the people of China on the grounds that shortwave broadcasting was a legacy technology and that the internet is the future. Well, all of that's fine and good. It may be the future, but it is. Uh, but only 15% of the people in China get the internet, and China just bought 290 shortwave transmitters because it is because shortwave radio is Beijing's favorite method of communicating with its own people. And so we consider this a legacy technology. Maybe it's a legacy technology in the USA, but not in other parts of the world. And so uh, th th there have been infiltrations by, by Muslim Brotherhood and, and, and Muslim Brotherhood front organizations into the US government that has made it essentially impossible for us to talk about religion. There, there was a, an excellent article two days ago in the, in, the, in the Wall Street Journal by an Egyptian writer who says that the U.S. government is effectively giving the radical ideology of, of Islamism uh, a, 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 a complete pass uh, and, and, and letting it basically dominate the, uh, uh, you know, dominate the airwaves, so to speak, and, and uh, with, without sufficient competition. And then in yesterday's paper, there was an article about uh, about how um, General Allen has decided to in, invite some of our Arab allies, uh, friend, friends uh, in the Gulf states, for example, uh, to try to fight the, the war of ideas. The problem is that the U.S. government isn't doing it. And covert action, this is something that covert action should do. I was talking with Judge Webster before, uh, at the beginning of the panel, and he was reminding me about how during the Cold War, um, our clandestine services were arranging for translated versions of the Federalist Papers to be covertly inserted into some of these different countries behind the Iron Curtain in order to inspire people with the extraordinary ideas therein. And, uh, and, and we've seen leaks about how they, they were distributing 
uh, copies of Dr. Zhivago, uh, and, and there, there are all sorts of things that we used to do as part of our covert influence operations. You know, when you use the word covert, it makes it sound evil and sneaky <laughs> and so on and so forth. But, the, 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 you know, one of the reasons of doing things covertly is to <coughs> let the ideas stand on their own without being associated with anybody out there, including us. It, you know, if, if our reputation is so bad in certain quarters, then why should our fingerprints be on certain ideas when the ideas should be able to stand on their own? And, and, and that's one, one of the great things about this initiative. And what makes this initiative here that Matt and his colleagues are doing are, is, is that they are demonstrating that it is, that, that it is possible to fight a war of ideas, uh, and, and it is having to be done by the private sector because the U.S. government effectively is not doing it. And, uh, and, and you know, the, to, to solve the problem within the U.S. government requ it requires, indeed, as the general said, some, some serious legislation. Uh, I believe that there ought to be a new U.S. public diplomacy agency that is set up that will have all public diplomatic functions put within it. In other words, the, uh, the former functions of the USIA, the visitors programs, the exchange programs, uh, the information programs, and so on. Uh, I think the women's programs, the labor programs, the, the human rights and democratization programs. USAID is mostly a, a public diplomacy agency. The Peace Corps is a public diplomacy agency. The Broadcasting Board of Governors is a public diplomacy agency. All of these should be put in one place. The, 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 the agency head ought to be a Deputy Secretary of State. That, that, deputy, that deputy secretary and agency head ought to be a member of the National Security, a statutory observer at the National Security Council. General Myers, as chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, was a statutory uh, member, uh, observer of the NSC. Uh, and, uh, and, and, and so such a person would be of the same rank as, as, uh, as the chairman and, and as the director of national intelligence. And then information policy and relations with people and not just governments are going to be there at the takeoffs of policy and not simply at the crash landings, as they like to say. <laughs> you know, you've made a disaster of the policy and now call in the crisis public relations firm to see if you can burnish your, the image of your brand that has been tarnished by, by, uh, by malpractice in statecraft. And so, I, um, I just would like to say that if we're going to be conducting a, a battle of ideas seriously, you have to know how uh, battles of you have to know the history of battles of ideas. You have to know how they have been conducted, <laughs> and covert action is one of those means by which it was done. You ha you have to uh, you you have to know the ver these various techniques, and you have to know something about ideas. And when we start talking here about about human rights, we open up a huge and rich uh, field of, 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 of human inquiry, where uh, you, you look first, uh, uh, first of all on the whole idea of what is a right. We talk about, I ask this to my students, some of you have been asked this, uh, those of you who have taken my class here, what's a right? You know, we talk about rights all the time, and yet uh, it's very hard for Americans to define what a right is, uh, because we don't study philosophy and we don't study civics very much. You know, we, one, one might call it, let's say, a just claim uh, that is due you by virtue of your, uh, your, your dignity as a human person. But all of that has, is pregnant with huge uh, implications. It, it, it implies the existence of justice, and you, but you can't have justice unless you have some kind of common shared idea about what are the objective, what are objective standards of right and wrong. Uh, today we live uh, in what Pope Benedict calls a dictatorship of relativism, where where uh, uh, you know everybody gets to choose what their own moral standards are, uh, and. Uh, 
and, and, and no civilization and, and, and no moral code is somehow better than another uh, because, uh, be, be, because there are no objective standards. Well, you know, if, if there were no objective standards, then, uh, then you could just say uh, that, that uh, you, you could do anything. If, if all of our moral standards, if all of our rights are determined by human reason, and therefore by majority vote, or by the, by the barrel of a gun, as opposed to being uh, objectively present, uh, through either in hearing in nature or being endowed by the Creator, as our, as our Declaration of Independence says, then, uh, then you could simply make slavery legal according to our Constitution. But would that make it just? You could you could uh, do it by majority vote. You could ratify slavery with uh, with three quarter by three quarters of the states. But that doesn't make it just because everybody in their hearts knows that slavery is not just. And perhaps, but but this involves some contemplation of questions about transcendent moral categories, which is something that is absent from the war of ideas. Because what's, what, what happens? The Islamists, the Islamists come along and they say, well, Allah wills everything. Allah is pure will. Allah wills every second of every minute of every day. And so if a terrorist decides that he wants to go blow up 60 Shiites in a marketplace in Baghdad, and he succeeds in doing it, he can then go off and say, well, it was Allah's will, wasn't it? Which means that translates into the terrorist's will being the equivalent of Allah's will. Well, is that real religion? Is that really what, is that Allah's will? To equate any, anybody's will with Allah's will? Or can you go, or can you argue that perhaps, uh, if that's the case, how do you know that Allah is, is, uh, is merciful? They, they don't, don't, doesn't it say in Islam, Allah, the, the merciful and the almighty, and so on and so forth? How do you know Allah is merciful if, 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 if anything that uh, any terrorist wants to do and succeeds in doing turns out to be Allah's will? Well, why don't we talk about these things? Most Muslims are not terrorists. Most Muslims don't believe that killing innocent people is something that's going to get you to heaven. Most Muslims believe fundamentally in their gut that there exists a natural law, a, 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 a law of decent behavior, as C.S. Lewis describes that law. And now these are, these are ideas which we, as Americans, should not shrink from talking about because they have the fundamental, fundamental standards of good. On our, they're on our side. And human rights are, are essential to this whole thing. And most people in the Muslim world will buy into it. And it's just a question of us having the courage of our convictions to stand up and say something that, that, uh, that the world so sorely needs. I, I could talk about this for a long time. So I just, I just want to thank you, Matt, for, for having the energy.